Hello, and welcome to this evening's webinar, Emotions and Nutrition in MS. This webinar series is brought to you by Can Do Multiple Sclerosis, the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, the Multiple Sclerosis Society of Canada, and MediMeds. My name is Krista Barnes, Programs Associate for Can Do MS. I will be your moderator this evening. Can Do MS delivers health and wellness education programs to help families with MS thrive. Please visit the Can Do MS website, CanDoMS.org, to learn more about Can Do MS online and national in-person programs. Can Do MS is decided to partner with the National MS Society to bring you 12 webinars in 2018. The mission of the National MS Society is to help people affected by MS live their best lives as they stop MS in its tracks, restore what has been lost, and end MS forever. You can explore other society programs, services, resources, and connection opportunities at nationalmssociety.org. MediMeds is a national nonprofit that connects people for free and anonymously through their website and helpline to programs that will help them afford the, their healthcare expenses. For more information, visit needymeds.org. We save about 15 minutes at the end of the webinar for questions and answers. If you have a question during this presentation, you can type it in using the question chat box found in your control panel. I encourage you all to be part of this interactive discussion. This presentation is being recorded and will be archived on the Can Do MS and the National MS Society's websites. Our speakers this evening, welcome ladies. We have psychologist Gail Lewis from New York, New York, and dietitian Mona Bostic from Greensboro, North Carolina. To kick things off, I'd like to hand the reins over to our speak speakers. So Gail, please take it away. Good evening. My name is Gail Lewis, and we're going to start by talking about the learning objectives of this evening. And we are hoping that by the end of tonight's webinar, participants and support partners will learn the following. How to recognize and understand hunger cues and learn ways to address them constructively how food is used to manage many different feelings and how to avoid this, the issues of using food for emotional management, the differences between healthy and unhealthy eating patterns, to learn about mindful and intuitive eating behaviors and how to use them when you eat, and when, where, and how to ask for help. So we're gonna start with a polling question. Do you think that your relationship with food is a healthy one? Please select one or more of the following, yes or no. Thank you for answering the polling question. According to your responses, 64% of you say that yes, you do think that your relationship with food is a healthy one, and 37% of you think that no, your relationship with food is not a healthy one. So why is it important that we discuss this? Why bother talking about this and having a webinar just focused on this issue? Studies show that more than 50% of people with MS will experience major depression and that developing anxiety is more common than developing depression in the MS population. That both are underdiagnosed, underreported, and undertreated. When these intense emotions are not being addressed in healthy ways, people use other means of coping, some not so healthy, such as either overindulging or restricting food intake. It's important to learn about emotional eating and ways to constructively address the behavior. Health anxiety has a strong relationship to food and diet. And it has been observed and heard in professional settings that there exists a noticeable co-occurrence of both restrictive and overeating behaviors in people affected by MS. So all of this raises questions about how food habits, both physical and emotional, and nutrition relate to 
and coexist with MS. So these are just some of the ways that MS can affect a person's life. One can be in shock, in denial, feel loss and grief, anxiety, depression, experience fear, behave in emotional stress eating, feel a loss of control, just feel an overwhelming sense of stress, dealing with symptoms of the disease and or medication side effects. There, of course, could be financial concerns and changes in family roles. MS impacts many areas of life. Mona, can you tell us a little more about healthy eating and how MS can present challenges to healthy eating? Yes, Gail, um, I'd be happy to. Uh, MS can make it hard to follow a healthy eating pattern, that's for sure. And many people out there might be thinking it has something to do with the fact that now that you have multiple sclerosis, you have different nutrition needs and that you will need to change your eating pattern. But that's just not the case. Uh, in fact, contrary to what you might have read on the internet and elsewhere, the guidelines for healthy a healthy eating pattern for someone with MS are exactly the same as for someone without MS. However, MS does pose some unique challenges to practicing a healthy eating pattern. For example, physical symptoms like pain, which makes everything harder, fatigue, which can contribute to a lack of motivation to eat. You might be too tired to cook. There, you could have a tendency to skip meals. Um, mobility and activity limitation, which could lead to uh, decreased activity, which can result in a decreased calorie expenditure. Uh, it could lead to difficulty shopping and preparing meals, as well as difficulty eating or feeding yourself. Swallowing difficulties might require modifications to food and beverages, the textures to prevent weight loss and nu nutrient deficiencies. And then there's medication side effects, which have been, uh, they can alter your appetite, either make it so you have an increased appetite or your appetite is diminished. It can cause sleep interruptions, meaning you're very wide awake and that can leave you feeling fatigued the next day. Or a side effect might be that the drug itself makes you sleepy or drowsy, which can also exacerbate that feeling of fatigue. Some medications cause GI upset and make it so that the eating process is not enjoyable. And other medications can make uh, your food taste funny and contribute to taste alterations. And that's all before we get to the emotional symptoms. Um, all of the challenges that Gail mentioned on the previous slide, which might result in depression or anxiety, which might lead to an increased intake of high fat foods or sweets. You might be eating out of fear, boredom, or another emotion, or you could have a complete loss of appetite altogether. Any of these things in any combination could contribute to malnutrition. Um, and so now that we've talked about some of the ways that, uh, that MS can interfere with engaging in a healthy eating pattern, let's talk a little bit more about what a healthy eating pattern includes. Um, but first and foremost, it's really important to mention that there's no such thing as a perfect eating pattern. That's with or without MS. Perfection itself is not a part of a healthy eating pattern. Of course, we spend a lot of uh, time focusing on the food that we choose to eat, and that's, that's not a, necessarily a bad thing because the food we choose to eat is important, but so is being flexible in our food choices, eating a variety of foods, and enjoying our foods. That's with family and friends, co-workers, and at social gatherings. Um, our food-related habits are also important. Um, and engaging in arbitrary restrictions or eliminating whole food groups is not a part of a healthy eating pattern. It simply means that you have fewer options to eat and depriving your body of the variety that it needs. Being overly focused on food is not a part of a healthy eating pattern. Is it good food, bad food? Um, and like I was saying, good food or bad food, moral judgments about food are not a part of a healthy eating pattern. 
food is neither good or bad, it's neutral. And when you add all these things together, it can have an impact on our relationship with food, which is part of why we eat. <coughs> Excuse me. So why do we eat? Uh, we might be eating because the clock says it's time. It's either lunchtime, din dinner time, breakfast time. Or maybe we're eating in response to an emotion like boredom, sadness, loneliness, frustration, or anger. Or it could be a party and there's a buffet. Or somebody offered and you don't want to be rude, right? I mean, how many times have you showed up at work when somebody next, you know, in the stall next to you or in the office next to you brings the donuts to the meeting? Um, and so you don't want to be rude, you, you have a donut. Most of these examples are external reasons or cues to eat. And then there's the, I'm hungry. And wow, what does that even feel like? Physical hunger is something that we seem to have unlearned the ability to recognize due to the strong influence of the external cues that surround us every day. Um, so Gail, I wonder, could you give us some insight into the impact of depression on our eating behaviors? I'd be happy to, Mona. Great. So as, as I said earlier, um, depression exists in more than 50% of people who have MS, which is a pretty significant percentage. And one of the most common signs of depression is a change in how much you eat. For some people with depression, this means a loss of appetite, while for others, the amount you eat may increase. And this leads into a bigger discussion about how eating can be highly emotional. And I believe Mona has a few things to add on this subject. Yes, Gail, um, I do actually. Um, ideally, uh, we would all eat in response to physical hunger just like we did when we were babies. But since we stopped being babies and we've you know, been impacted by all of these external cues, um, it's, it's a little bit tougher to tune into that. And food is such a part of the celebrations, traditions, and experiences we share with friends and family. In fact, food is intertwined with most of the emotional events in our lives. Joyous celebrations, holiday traditions, condolences, and yes, even comfort. Comfort is so associated with food that they named a food after it. Um, the health impact of comfort food stems from the fact that most folks don't turn to something like kale in certain, you know, when they're looking for comfort. Uh, instead, we typically turn to something with a lot of salt, fat, or sugar. And over time, if this happens a lot, it can begin to have a negative impact on your health. On the flip side, um, if we arbitrarily restrict food out of fear that we may be inadvertently having a negative impact on our health, that could result in nutrient deficiencies or malnutrition. Um, but it's important to remember that eating is one of the most emotionally in charged experiences we have in our lives, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's the balance. Um, so what are some of the consequences of imbalance, and how do we know if we are out of balance? Um, just like most things in life, balance is key. Again, balance, not perfection. Although there are no specific nutrition requirements associated with a multiple sclerosis diagnosis, research has shown that having a comorbid or coexisting chronic health condition along with MS is associated with an increase in disability and a decrease in quality of life. So if you have one of the conditions listed here on the slide, then it would be, or so if you have one of these conditions and are frequently choosing foods and or activities that might over time have a negative impact on your blood pressure, your blood fats, blood sugar, et cetera, then these choices may begin to have a negative impact on how you're living with MS. And so how often is too often? 80-20 um, is a, if you, the 80-20 rule, um, not sure if anybody's ever heard of that, but the 80-20 rule is not about restrictions or deprivation it is about balance. It is not a diet. It is a tool to help you determine if the frequency of your choices is likely to have a negative impact on your health. Usually, if you are choosing nourishing foods and engaging in other healthy habits, 
like exercise and, and honoring, uh, getting good night's sleep, if you're doing those things 80% of the time, then it's not going to significantly impact your health if you make different choices the other 20% of the time. However, if that balance gets flipped and you're making health promoting choices closer to 20% of the time, then you will likely see a negative impact on your health. And that might be an indicator that it's time to reach out to your healthcare team for guidance. Um, resilience is an important part with living with MS and resilience requires adjustment. Dieting is sometimes used as a coping tool um, to regain control over what MS has so significantly impacted, and that's our body. Um, black and white or inflexible or rigid thinking can give us a measure of security because after all, who doesn't wanna think that they have all of the answers? But it can also cut us off from the complexity and richness of life and balanced thinking means we have a richer life. Some examples of black and white thinking can be, um, it's all or nothing. Um, I quote, blew my diet today, so I might as well just go off the wagon all week and not pay any attention to the foods that I'm eating because I've done this, you know, this quote, bad thing today. But that is typically an external food rule, and these food rules are, um, often enforced by the food police. I know we all know who they are, and the food police are never far away. So how do the food police interfere with your body's cues? Overt, those overt food police like Dr. Google has spent a lot of money uh, taunting your fears about food and MS with little or no science to back up any of his or her claims. Of course, his supplements, regimens, protocols, and food rules that he's willing to charge you for are offered up to help calm your fears, but they don't in turn improve your multiple sclerosis. Um, it's important to recognize when you are being motivated by fear. Um, that's because making choices based on fear is only about avoiding anxiety and will seldom lead to the healthiest decisions. Uh, more subtle than Dr. Google are the often well-meaning friends, family members, co-workers, or etc., who know that you have MS and have read the latest recommendations by Dr. Google and with the best of intentions ask, should you be eating that? <laughs> and don't forget yourself because you can also be your own food police. This can look like beating yourself up for veering from your quote eating plan eating forbidden foods, or eating forbidden foods in forbidden amounts. This might be happening without you even realizing it, and I promise it was never your idea to begin with. Uh, judging our eating decisions is not something that we were born doing. Uh, food shaming and blaming never helps someone feel better about taking care of their body, and it won't help you live well with MS. Something to consider, it's not you who becomes more in control, through dieting or restrictive eating habits, it's the food that now controls you. And these behaviors may begin to contribute to your cravings. Uh, so for example, if I told you today that you could no longer eat ice cream starting tomorrow, what would you be thinking about tonight, right? Ice cream, of course. Um, even if that's not even something that you gravitate towards because you've planted that forbidden food. Uh, restriction, it turns out, is a fantastic predictor for feeling out of control around food and for creating cravings. Gail, can you shed some light on binging and restricting practices? Of course I can. Thank you, Mona. Sure. So let's talk about the extremes, binging and restricting. Not everybody goes to these extremes, but it's important to understand how they might happen. Let's start with binging. Some might rationalize, after all, why not? I deserve to treat myself. After all, I have a chronic illness. I'm suffering enough. I shouldn't be deprived of other things like food that I enjoy. After all, what else can I enjoy? And what does it matter that I eat a quart of ice cream? My body is unhealthy from the MS anyway. 
Does any of this sound familiar to you? And then we have the other end of the spectrum, restricting. This can operate by feeling physically hungry and making an active decision not to eat. We can look at that as taking control over something your body is communicating. Since you can't be in charge of your MS, its symptoms, and the suffering that comes as a result, how you deal with your hunger is something you can control. Being in charge of the suffering is the thing. So some binge, eat, or mindlessly spurge out of feeling bored, feeling anxious, feeling depressed, angry, resentful, and also feeling resigned. And as I said a moment ago, in restricting, it's more of an active decision to eat less. And it can feel really empowering to try to restrict or control one's intake of food when otherwise you do not feel empowered in your life. So now we have another polling question for you to answer. Do you ever turn to food when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed from your MS? So please select from one of the following, yes, no, or sometimes. Thank you. So according to your responses, 26% of you said that yes, you do turn to food when you're stressed, overwhelmed, and from your MS. 31% of you said that no, you do not turn to food when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed from your MS. And 44% of you that says that sometimes you do turn to food when you're feeling overwhelmed or stressed from your MS. Thank you everyone for answering the polling question. Now Mona is going to talk to you about hunger cues. Mona. Yes, um, so one of the things that when we, I, as I was saying earlier, that um, when we were born, this is how we respond to physical hunger because we recognize our internal hunger cues. But the question is that do you even recognize hunger and fullness? Uh, given that we're coming up to the holidays, I know everybody understands what Thanksgiving full is, and that will be indicated by the 10 on the scale. Um, but it's really important to be able to recognize these cues so that you can respond to them. Uh, but first, let's take a minute and define appetite. What is appetite? It's the desire to eat food whether or not there is physical hunger. It may be triggered by factors such as the time of day, social occasions, emotions, or the sight or smell of food. And what is a hunger cue, and how is it different? A cue is simply a trigger that encourages you to act in a certain way. Often, people are not conscious of these cues, and they, then these cues can uh, impact our behavior and choices. There are internal cues, like metabolic influences, digestive function, illness or infection, medication effects. And then there are external cues, some of which I pointed out on the why we eat slide. The social situation, meaning you're by yourself at home or maybe you're at a party, the time of day, it's lunchtime, um, the sensory properties of the food, wow, that smells really good, or maybe it really doesn't. <laughs> Uh, the cultural background, uh, environment, social climactic. So if it's very hot, if it's very cold, these things can impact your appetite. Um, the ability to recognize and respond to these cues is in an intentional way. It's a powerful thing, and it takes some practice. The idea is to eat when you are gently hungry and to check in as you're eating during the course of the meal and recognize when you are comfortably full or satisfied. It takes 20 minutes for your brain to get the message that your belly is full. So if you wait until your Thanksgiving full to stop eating, then you're probably going to be uncomfortable at the end of the meal. And remember, it is normal to sometimes eat past the point of fullness. Uh, and it's also important to remember that just because your cues are quiet does not mean you don't need to eat food. If you have no appetite and you've begun to recognize that, it would be important to recognize that pattern and keep a list of things around that you don't mind eating 
when you don't have an appetite and then have a reminder or something on your phone to try to eat consistently through the, throughout the day because you give yourself the best chance at recognizing comfortable hunger and fullness by giving your body consistent, regular, and satisfying meals throughout the day. And another way to say kind of the same thing is describing what physical hunger feels like versus emotional hunger. Um, you, if you haven't actually thought about it, you might not recognize that there's a difference, but if you think about physical hunger, it comes on gradually. It occurs several hours after a meal. It strikes below the neck. It's when, you're, when your stomach is grumbling. And it can be satisfied with any type of food. Even that leftover casserole that you've had way too many servings of, if you actually ate it, it would make physical hunger be satisfied. It goes away when full, and once you are full, you can stop eating. And it leaves you with a feeling of satisfaction, not guilt. Um, that's an important thing. Because emotional hunger is a little bit different. It comes on suddenly and feels urgent. It's unrelated to the time since the last meal. You may have just finished lunch, but now you're feeling this urgent need to eat something. Um, it occurs above the neck and usually involves a specific craving like pizza, ice cream, chips, donuts, something. Uh, and it persists despite fullness and it can often lead to eating more than you normally would. And after you've eaten in this way, it may leave you feeling gu guilty or disappointed or upset with yourself. So there is a difference between a physical hunger and an emotional hunger. And it's important to maybe uh, use this description and when you're looking at your own eating patterns to see if it can um, be of any help. But Gail, can you tell us about mindful eating and intuitive eating and how we might be able to use those tools? Absolutely, Mona. And this comes at a really good time after the slide that you just spoke about. So what is mindful eating? Being mindful is about actively paying attention and how it can help a person be more attuned to the decisions that we make around eating. First, we need to ask these questions. Are you a distracted eater? Do you pay attention to the kinds of foods you pick to eat? Does it feel like you've actually made an active choice to eat those foods? And as I said, eating mindfully is paying attention to all of the processes involved in deciding. And the deciding factor is most important here. Deciding when, how, where, and why one eats. So let's talk about intuitive eating and how that might be a little different. So when we speak of intuitive eating, we can learn, lean back to Mona's discussion of hunger and fullness cues. Intuitive eating requires a person to be attuned to the experiences of being hungry and full and using those cues to determine when you start to eat and when you stop eating. It means eating when you are physically hungry and stopping when you are physically full. That would be on the slide that was previous to the mindful slide, it would be in the column on the left-hand side of the screen about physical hunger. This requires being attuned to one's appetite and feeling satiated. And as Mona said, appetite means wanting to eat and feeling a physical need to eat. And satiated means feeling fed and satisfied from the foods you've eaten. We often overlook one of the most basic gifts of existence, which is the pleasure and satisfaction that can be found in the eating experience. When you eat what you really want in an environment that is inviting and conducive, the pleasure you derive will be a powerful force in helping you feel satisfied and content. By providing this experience for yourself, you will find that it takes much less food to decide that you've had enough. So healthy eating 
comes from being able to pay attention to oneself fully, completely, and to be able to identify our feelings. We need to ask ourselves the following. Are we being fed? Are we feeding ourselves in ways that are satisfying, that help us manage our feelings so that we don't use food as a way to regulate uncomfortable feelings? And healthy eating comes from being able to pay attention to oneself fully. This is not an easy thing to do, I realize, but it's really important. It's important to do to be able to identify your feelings and to know, or if not, develop knowledge about ways to address your feelings constructively. So we also want to know how to address our feelings constructively. And this might mean speaking to your support partner, joining a support group, seeing an individual counselor, or seeing a nutritionist or a dietitian, rather than through the use of food to either numb feelings, suppress feelings, or control feelings. However, being mindful and trying to eat intuitively can be challenging. These are things that take practice, especially when there are particular internal and external cues that set you off, which Mona can speak to. Mona, can you please talk more about that? Absolutely, Gail. Um, the power of behavioral cues is strong and the, it, it's real. Um, how many of us can say that our digestive enzymes start churning just because we walk in the back door after work and smell dinner cooking uh, we walk past the popcorn counter at the movie, or heck, you can even smell it popping before you get to the counter. Um, you see a favorite dessert. Uh, you pass a favorite fast food place uh, on the, you know, on the road home. Uh, going on vacation. Some people just going on vacation gets their digestive juices flowing in anticipation of vacation food. Uh, feeling stressed, feeling afraid or lonely. Or watching television some people that's that's when it happens and the more often we rehearse a certain response meaning the more often we have a snack while we watch TV um, the stronger the cue is going to become and that's going to mean that it may trigger you to have a snack or plan for a snack every time you watch television and it's important to remember that it takes time to change an established habit or behavioral response to the cues Think about how long you've been practicing your current habits. Um, and so Gail is going to talk to us about some important tips about how to respond differently to those cues. Thank you, Mona. And I, I just want to reiterate what Mona just said, that some of these things that we're suggesting, they might sound like they're pretty easy coming out of our mouths, but we both know that these are very challenging changes very important changes, but any kind of behavior change, it takes time and it takes practice and it takes being compassionate to yourself in taking this time. So back to what Mona was talking about, about how you can respond differently to these bell ringing cues. So first, my suggestion would be to take a breath. This makes room to think. And thinking mediates acting compulsively and helps one address food mindfully. When you're overwhelmed with feelings, it's really hard to think. So you might want to cue into how you feel in this space that you've created for yourself. And you might think that eating X, Y, or Z ice cream, for example, will help you address that feeling. And you ask yourself, will it actually help address that feeling? Has it helped before? If so, for how long? Did the feeling come back pretty quickly after you ate XYZ? And I encourage you to try to be as honest as possible with yourself here. So you also want to check in. Is this related to physical hunger? And back to one of Mona's slides earlier, Physical hunger is felt from the neck down. Is this a physical hunger that's being felt from the neck down or is it from the neck up? So one trick that I have is to ask yourself, am I hungry enough to eat an apple? Or are you hungry enough to eat something healthy? Maybe you don't like apples. 
Um, but if you're not hungry enough to eat something healthy, then you're probably not physically hungry. And practice paying attention to the difference between emotional cues and physical cues for hunger. Mona, do you have anything to add to this? Absolutely. Um, let's see. change. There we go. Um, so when I'm overwhelmed, bored, angry, depressed, stressed, or anxious, I fill in the blank. Um, so if, if the answer to that, that you would fill that in with is eat, I think it's important, uh, based on the things that Gail and I have been talking about, I think it's important that when it comes to responding to emotions with food, ultimately it would be good for your physical as well as your emotional health. Um, if you could develop a toolbox that includes a variety of ways to respond to your emotions besides just eating, besides just food, or to be able to fill in the blank with something besides eat. But instead of trying to get rid of emotional eating as a coping tool, um, try to add some other tools to the toolbox so that you have a variety of ways to soothe yourself when you're feeling overwhelmed, bored, angry, depressed, stressed, or anxious. Allow food to be one of several tools, and whenever you do choose eating as a way of coping, try to remain mindful during the experience, notice how the food is making you feel, and then move on. No guilt or remorse, just move on. Um, but when you're doing this, it's as Gail has said, it's really important to be patient with yourself because cues are very powerful and manage, managing cues can be very complicated. It takes a great deal of time and effort to counter old habits and build new ones. Begin with small steps and stay focused as you learn to recognize these food triggers and change your responses to them. Learning to manage cues appropriately is just a part of your journey towards a healthier body. Um, and so far we've talked about mindful eating, intuitive eating, and the 80-20 rule as tools to add to the toolbox. But anticipating our needs and planning around them is another way to address our need. So what do you do when hunger strikes and the pantry is bare? Um, that's generally when we're vulnerable. When we don't have another option, that's when you're going to order a pizza or hit the drive-through because the pantry is bare. Uh, for that reason, it's best to try to aim to be organized and adaptable. And I know those things might be counterintuitive, but it is possible. Uh, stay open-minded and you'll eat with less stress. Uh, as much as possible, it's helpful to keep your cupboards and fridge from becoming bare. Uh, one idea is to create a list of foods and or meals that are easy to prepare, that are appealing and nourishing to your body. And as you generate these ideas, it's important to be flexible and adjust as needed. Um, and what I, one example of that might be to uh, consider foods, consider a list of foods and keeping some of these things on hand to eat when your hunger cues are not present or when you have little or no desire to eat. Essentially, I'm asking you to plan for eating. Um, because a little planning up front can save time and money and also make it easier to respond to your hunger cues. A few questions to consider. Is the kitchen stocked? Where will I be the next time that I'm hungry? What food will be available? In other words, if you know you're gonna be running errands and you might be stuck in traffic, should you bring a snack along? Should you have something available that you will enjoy but that will also be nourishing so that maybe you won't be as tempted to stop at the, uh, respond to your external cue and stop at the drive-through somewhere? Consider making a list of snacks or light meals that usually sustain you for a couple of hours. And if you need to pack something to take with you, that's a great that's, that's a great idea. Um, so, Gail, now let's take a look at a few real world scenarios to see to apply what we've learned. Would you introduce us to our first scenario? I'd love to. So let's meet Judy. Judy was recently diagnosed with MS. Judy has begun to severely restrict her diet in an effort to control her MS, 
and she has heard about various foods making MS symptoms worse, and her anxiety about eating has resulted in a significant weight loss over the past six months. So we wondered, what could Judy do to help her situation? So we've come up, Mona and I have come up with some suggestions for Judy that might be helpful. So due to the probable feelings of anxiety, depression, and loss of control, in consequence to her recent MS diagnosis, I, as a psychologist, suggested that Judy do the following. Get a medication consult for an antidepression that also addresses anxiety and or a prescription for additional anti-anxiety medication. Seek out help both from a support group of newly diagnosed people with MS and from an individual psychotherapist for verbal psychotherapy and to learn constructive coping skills for dealing with her MS. And speak to a dietitian skilled in addressing Judy's restricted food intake and her concerns about the benefits and risks to her MS of eating and limiting certain foods in her diet. Mona, as a dietitian, what are some additional suggestions and thoughts you have for Judy? Um, yes, so when I'm hearing that Judy, a couple of things pop out to me immediately, and that's that she has begun to restrict her food significantly. So I would want to share with her that food choice can impact MS-related symptoms, but not the disease course. So I would want to um, have her speak with someone about her health beliefs to see if, see if she, so we can strengthen her health literacy, strengthen her understanding about what she might be reading or, or what she might be hearing. But it also mentions that she's had a significant um, weight loss. And I would say that it's really important if that weight loss was not intended, um, Sometimes people think that if, if she happens to be, let's say Judy was morbidly obese, even if she had just lost lost um, 75 pounds from down from 400, uh, you might think, well, she had the weight to lose. But if that weight was lost in an unintentional way, she's at great risk of malnutrition, regardless of what the number says on the scale, because she might be losing muscle mass. And if she loses muscle mass, then she's going to, that's, that's not good for anybody, but especially someone with MS. So I think it's very important that she speak with a dietitian to help her sort out, to make sure her nutrition needs are meeting, I mean, her intake is meeting her needs. And everything that I think Gail mentioned would support that completely. Uh, so let's take a look at another scenario. We're going to meet Carl. Um, Carl is diagnosed with progressive MS. He has gained 20 pounds since retiring on disability from his job as a policeman. His wife Martha says that he has become increasingly irritable and withdrawn from the family. Carl spends his time watching sports and police show reruns on television while snacking on chips and beer. Um, Gail, what are some of the suggestions you might have for Carl? Thank you, Nina. Some of the suggestions I have for Carl would start with recommending that he seeks out being part of a support group to address his apparent isolation. To recommend that Carl seeks out a medication consult for an antidepressant prescription which is known to be very effective in treating depression. I'd also recommend that Carl seeks out individual psychotherapy to help him manage his depressive symptoms and learn more constructing, constructive, empowering coping skills. I'd also recommend that Carl seeks out a physical therapist or an exercise physiologist to suggest possible approaches to staying active and healthy in his retirement. And I'd also recommend Carl seek out help with a dietitian to address his diet. And Mona, what kind of tips would you have from a dietitian's perspective? Um, well, for Carl, um, I noticed he's gained weight and he is 
he's more sedentary. He's sitting and watching television and snacking on 20% snacks rather than the 80% snacks. Um, I would encourage Carl to manage if he already has a comorbid chronic health condition, like say type two diabetes or high blood pressure, uh, it's important to manage those. Or if he happens to not have those, to, to act and to behave and eat in a way that would prevent having, I mean, acquiring one of those conditions. Um, and given he and his wife, I think it's important that Carl be engaged in his own health. Uh, he needs to have a motivation. Why does he want to be healthy? And what choices does he need to make to do that? Because if he is getting all of these external um, expectations from a, a doctor or his wife, then it's gonna just make him feel more resentful. So it's important that, that Carl kind of get in touch with why it's important for him to be healthy. Um, but we don't wanna forget about, I mentioned Martha, we don't wanna forget about the support partner in this equation. Gail, what recommendations do you have for Carl's wife, Martha? Thank you, Lana. Um, I, I think that obviously um, Martha is dealing with a lot of stress from MS. And as, as probably all of you listening know, MS is not just about the person who has MS. It's about the people surrounding the MS person. And Martha, as what it seems like in the scenario as Carl's primary support, she's probably dealing with a lot of issues and a lot of stress. And I, I would recommend for her that she seeks out individual therapy, uh, that she also seeks out a support partner group, and that she and Carl and any other members of the family that they would think would be feasible to attend should attend family therapy. It's a really good opportunity to talk about their feelings, talk about what it's like to have this new feature in their life of Carl's MS. And in some ways, most importantly, I think that it's really a good idea for Martha to continue engaging in activities that she has been doing that give her pleasure that she was doing prior to Carl's diagnosis. And in this way, she can create and continue to have a sense of individuality for herself. So let's take a, a look at some of the key takeaways from today's webinar. Mona. Yes, um, absolutely. So we've we've talked about quite a few things tonight. We have uh, we've reviewed the various challenges to healthy eating posed by multiple sclerosis. We've talked about mindful and intuitive eating approaches. We've talked about recognizing and responding to hunger and fullness cues. And we have encouraged you to be patient with yourself because making changes takes time. Uh, we've encouraged you to make a plan for eating. And we've talked about how to know when, how, and where to ask for help, which brings me to um, Gail is going to tell you about some of the resources that we recommend for you going forward. So if you'd like to learn more about some of the topics that Mona and I have covered tonight, here are some of the resources that you can use to gain more information and to follow up with some of the things that you learned. First of all is to share your concerns and some of the issues that came up tonight with your healthcare team. Uh, also request a referral to a registered dietitian. There's a website here that you can go to. Request a referral to a mental health expert. And we also have another website that you can go to through the National MS Society. And here we have um, three recommended readings. Um, two are on intuitive eating, and one is on eating, which is more focused on the mindfulness that I talked about earlier. Okay, well, thank you so much to Gail and Mona. We really appreciate both of you this evening and all the information that you both provided. Um, so we have a little bit of time for questions and answers now. Um, and we had a number of you type some questions in this evening. So we will um, go through as many of those as we can. Um, 
So the first one I'm going to direct towards you, Mona. Um, so healthy eating, how do you stick with it? What tips do you have? Um, how can you continue to eat healthy consistently? Um, so my first answer to that question is one that I find people, whenever I'm working with them, it's the one that they have the most difficulty uh, answering when I ask them, why is this important to you? What, what, what's motivating you to want to do this? Uh, and that is honestly the most important thing. If you're not sure why you're wanting to make these changes or to be healthier, then everything after it just gets harder. So if you're able to create a visual representation of why it's important to you, maybe you want to walk your child down the aisle at their wedding, maybe you want to be able to attend a graduation or take a vacation, have a photograph or something visual that you can place in a place, you know, someplace you see often at your desk at work or on your mirror in your bathroom. So the motivation piece, that's very important. But once you've got that, then I think the other thing that's really important is that you start small. Um, you, it's the baby steps that get you to the big picture, long-term goal that you're working on. So have a long-term goal, but break that down into smaller, um, incremental steps that will get you there and celebrate each success that you make along the way to your big ultimate goal, which may take you some time to get there. But that I think is how I would answer that question. Motivation. Can I, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Um, in just to continue what Mona was saying, I, I think starting small is terrific. And not to be a party pooper here, but I, I think it's important for you to recognize that this is kind of a two step forward, one step back kind of thing, or one step forward, two step back, whichever the way you want to look at it, that you're not going to always be able to stick to even your small goals. Um, and it's not because you're not trying. It's not because you're doing everything that you said you were going to do. But sometimes life gets in the way of us trying to incorporate new things and new behaviors into our lives. And sometimes stress can overtake all of our best intentions and take us backwards. It doesn't mean it's a permanent backwards. It just might be a momentary backwards. But you can always continue on the journey and take steps forward. And in my experience, and this is just reiterating another thing that Mona said, is that if you take small steps, and in fact, if you stretch out the time that you try to get to your goal, the longer lasting the results are gonna be. Yes, Thank and you. I would like to add something else to that if I could. As Gail said, that it's two steps forward and one step back or something. I like to think of that one step back as the 20% of the time you're choosing something different. So maybe you're going to your goal is to exercise every day, but tomorrow it's gloomy and you it's just not going to happen. If you don't do that, if you don't participate in your exercise plan tomorrow, it doesn't mean that the week is shot. It just means tomorrow is one of the, you know, something in that 20% where you made a different choice. That's fine. That's not going to derail you for your, your long-term goal. So yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, ladies. Um, so the next question I have, it, we had a number of people ask questions very similar to this one. Um, so Mona, do gluten-free, paleo, vegetarian, or keto diets uh, help with MS? Um, the shortest answer I can give to that question is no. No, period, and that's the that's that, no. However, I'm just gonna add to that a little bit in the context of what we've been talking about tonight is that none of these, these are all external food rules that somebody on the internet or somebody somewhere has decided, um, it has a lot of rules and there's things that you're supposed to eat and things you're supposed to avoid and times you're supposed to do it. And some of these things listed here may help you with uh, health, I mean, like, for example, a vegetarian diet, there's nothing unhealthy about that. But if none, if these things cannot be your forever diet, 
then it doesn't matter because anything that you do, um, it has to be the new normal. You can't be say keto for, you can't practice a ketogenic diet for 30 days and then go back to whatever you were doing before and think that that's going to have any lasting impact. Um, so unless something can be your forever diet, it's not something that's worth pursuing at all. And regardless of whether it has other health benefits, like a vegetarian diet has other health benefits, but none of, none of that has been proven in any studies to have any impact on the course of the MS disease process. In addition to that, these food rules can interfere with your uh, internal uh, food cues and they can interfere with your social function, your gathering, because you think, well, I can't attend that party because I'm trying to eat keto or I'm trying to eat paleo or whatever. And you worry that there won't be something there for you. So you end up like abstaining from the, from the party. And I think going to the party would actually end up being better for you living with MS than following one of these, these uh, arbitrary uh, diets. That's what I, oh, and then one final thing, for example, keto. I've noticed a lot of people who do the ketogenic diet, they have cheat days with it, and I'm doing that in air quotes. And I would suggest strongly that if you have to cheat on your diet, I think it's time to consider breaking up with your diet because, again, if it can't be a new normal, there's just no real value in it at all. But yes, the answer to the question is no. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, so this next question is, how can everyone in my family enjoy food necessary for my health? How can I approach this conversation? So mm -hmm. I guess I'll, I'll answer that question first. This is Mona. Um, I would say that I'm so glad somebody asked that question because it kind of highlights my answer to the previous question. Uh, if the person who's asking this question how can everyone in my family enjoy food necessary for my health? Well, I've stated several times in this presentation that a diet that's healthy for you, the person with MS, is the same diet, the same eating pattern that's going to be healthy for your spouse and your children and your grandparents and your nieces and your nephews. So there's no reason to be eating different food at different times and in different ways than anybody else who might be sharing a meal with you. Um, so I would think that would be the important thing for somebody, a conversation for somebody to have. Uh, and I, I, how can I approach this conversation? Uh, I think maybe Gail could answer that part, but I do think it's an important conversation to have. If the children, for example, if it's the age old question of the kids don't like vegetables and so on. I think that would give you an opportunity to model healthy eating behaviors around your children. But generally speaking, everyone can enjoy the same foods and all be promoting their health. Um, in, in response to the how can I approach this conversation? Well, I think that probably the best way to start is to have everybody sit down and talk together. Um, get a sense of your family's understanding about your MS and the changes that you are trying to make in your food intake and why you're trying to do that. And the challenges that you have in trying to do that. I think it's important to be as honest as possible. To talk about um, the reasons behind it, the challenges that you have, and the hope, the hope that you are feeling and that is motivating this wish to change, and perhaps also to encourage and give hope to your family that there can be something empowering that you're doing and that you could all do together. And then talk about some of the foods that you are considering incorporating into your meal plan. And Talk about uh, with your family members if what you have picked, if what seems to be on your, your menu for the day, for the week, if they're in agreement, if these are foods that they like to eat. And let's just say you come up with a food that, um, that some of your family members don't like to eat. I think compromise is a really important element here. 
um, but you can arrive at a compromise without talking about it. So if your child says, well, I don't like spinach, I don't want to eat spinach, let's just be hopeful that your child likes another green vegetable. So you talk to your child about, well, okay, if not spinach, is there another green vegetable that we can have instead? And you can still have the spinach if you'd like, um, and you can get help in the kitchen and everybody can participate together cooking, but it's, it's a way to all work together and you're not always going to agree on everything, and that's okay. I think it's important for, as I said earlier in this scenario with Carl and his wife Martha, that while everybody is going to try to work together and try to make adjustments due to the presence of this new being, this new MS in the, in the family, I think everybody also should get to be able to do their own thing. So maybe there's going to be one or two nights where uh, your husband or your wife feels like they want to cook their own food, but they're also going to help you make the food that you like. Um, I, and I, I think that the flexibility that we've discussed earlier and that Mona really pointed to is a very important aspect of this, but it all starts with communicating. Great, thank you both for addressing that question. Um, Gail, I have another one for you. Uh, so how do I feed myself if not with food? Okay, a real psychological question here. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, when, this actually you know, might be something that many of you are thinking as a result of, of our webinar today. Well, because you've been using food as a way to deal with your feelings, to, to feed your feelings. So what do I do now? What do I do instead? And a simple but complicated answer is that what do you do to self-soothe? Um, what kinds of behaviors have you engaged with before that have helped you feel calm, that have helped you feel grounded. And of course, taking into consideration the limitations that you might have because of your MS might change some of those self-soothing techniques. For example, if taking a walk is something that had been calming for you before and your mobility is, is more challenged at this point, is there another thing that you can do as a substitution? Um, if, you are, if you have a walker, are you able to take a walk outside? Can you take a walk with somebody? Um, things that are relaxing, things that might even be distracting. Um, have a conversation with somebody. Talk to your support partner. Let them know what you're feeling. It's also a very intimate thing to do that when you're feeling overwhelmed and instead of reaching for food, which is really not an interpersonal reaction, to instead reach out to a person and talk to them about what's going on. Let them know, let them in. It really can have a wonderful effect of bringing you closer. And it can also open the door for your support partner to talk about how they feel. And if not your support partner, maybe reach out to a friend. Maybe a friend can come over, maybe you can go over to a friend's home, maybe you could do something social. Things that give you pleasure, things that give you a sense of calm, and it's pretty individualized, but I would imagine that all of you have some kind of toolbox of self-soothing techniques that you can think of that at other sources of stress, at other times of stress you have used before. So I would encourage you to use those familiar techniques and also try to think of other ones. Try to get some ideas from people close to you who know you, who know what you like that maybe you're having a difficult time conjuring for yourself. So those are kinds of ways to feed yourself if not with food. Because food in this case actually is not really feeding yourself. It's really, um, it's really distracting you and pushing away feelings. And in the scenarios that I'm suggesting, I'm asking that you try to allow yourself to have and respect your feelings and not try to push them away. So that's how I would deal with that. Awesome, thank you. 
Um, so I like this next question. It hit home for me because I like potato chips, but here's the question. Um, when I'm anxious, I reach for potato chips. I don't want them in the house because I, I know that I will grab them. And sometimes they're just calling my name. But my son loves them and munches on them when him and his friends hang out. I don't want to deny him. What do I do? All right. So this is a tough one. I think um, an easy response would be to ask your son to eat the potato chips with his friends outside of your home. So done, potato chips outside of your house. You don't have to worry about that anymore. However, there are gonna be potato chips in all sorts of locations that you haven't planned for. You're walking down the street and you happen to pass a store and they're having a sale on potato chips. So they have potato chip bags in the window. You're in the supermarket and you happen to be going down the beverage and snack aisle and you see potato chips. Um, I'm not really that sure there's a preponderance of potato chips that are, are in your daily life, but, but just go with me on this. So my, my point is that you can't stop yourself from seeing and being triggered by your observation of an interaction with potato chips or whatever the food is that triggers you and let's just instead of potato chips let's call them triggers so there's really no way to avoid your triggers um, even even in your home as best as you possibly can because as you said you don't want to deny your son the enjoyment that he has with his friends and eating his potato chips. And the truth of the matter is, is I don't think that it's, it's your son's responsibility to keep you from reacting to your triggers, nor is it anybody else's responsibility in your home to keep you from reacting to your triggers. It's your responsibility. Um, and it's your responsibility to try to find ways to manage that differently, to manage that in ways that feel, might feel quite uncomfortable at first, but that you can try to ground yourself in. What I said earlier, taking a breath. I always recommend taking a breath is the best thing to do. It really creates space to think about it. To so think about, do I really want those potato chips? And the question that I asked earlier, it, when I've had the potato chips before, I thought they'd make me feel better, but in actuality, they only made me feel better for about three seconds, and then I felt really guilty it's important to take a breath um, if you want to eat the potato chips and think about some of the questions that Mona and I discussed earlier and ask yourself, well, when I've had the potato chips before, did it really make me feel better? And if it did make me feel better when I ate them, how long did that last? And you'll probably discover it didn't last for very long, maybe, maybe a few seconds actually. And then what ensued was a feeling of guilt. And it's hard to keep that all in mind when you're reaching for the bag of potato chips. But my point is that it's a really good idea and individual therapy and a support group can really help you find coping skills to deal with those moments so that you can be more in charge of dealing with those triggers. Great, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for one last question. Uh, Mona, I think I'll direct this one towards you. So how do you eat properly if you have no appetite? Well, um, so as I say, just because you don't have an appetite doesn't mean you don't have to eat. It just means it's a little bit more difficult. But first thing that I would ask is, um, you should let your your doctor and or your healthcare team know that you don't have an appetite and how long that's been going on. Um, it might be that there's a medication that needs to be adjusted. It could be that if medication is not the reason, perhaps anxiety or depression, or there's some other reason that's contributing to your lack of appetite. Uh, so let your healthcare providers know about that and have them to help sort out what's causing it but in the event that it's not it's something that you have to learn to adapt to um, it's a, there are some things that you can eat 
that are more enjoyable when you don't have an appetite. I can't imagine, and I suppose everyone would be different, but if I really wasn't hungry for food, I don't think I'd want some tacos or something very spicy or have a list of foods and keep them on hand that you would be able to tolerate and, and enjoy on a consistent basis. Maybe it's a bowl of cereal, maybe it's some soup, maybe it's, you know, there's things like that that you can have on hand, a smoothie that you can add extra colorful um, vegetables and fruits to, maybe that will be soothing going down even in the absence of an appetite. But when you have no appetite and you're eating less frequently, it's even more important to make sure that the foods that you're choosing have a lot of nutritional bang for the buck uh, because you don't want to become, you don't want to lose weight and become malnourished. And that's why I would say uh, as a last resort, these beverages like Ensure and the like, if you can tolerate nothing except that, that is not a bad thing because it is a balanced, um, it, it's like a, it's a balanced meal in a beverage. So if you have no appetite and the, it might be a good idea to keep something like that around the house. Um, in addition to keeping a list of foods that are easy to prepare and you enjoy and can tolerate even in the absence of an appetite, but definitely let your healthcare team know what's going on. Can I, can I add something to that? Absolutely. Of course. Um, I think that what, what also might be important is, um, to think about, do you have no appetite because you're depressed? Um, because depression can have a very strong effect on, on one's uh, capacity to tune into being hungry and to being interested in food. Um, and I know appetite isn't necessarily about being hungry, but being interested in eating. Uh, and there are, I think there are a lot of circumstances in which people find that they're just not interested in eating uh, when they're feeling overwhelmed by something, particularly depression. So I think, I think it's an important thing to do as best as you can to try to check in with yourself about, you know, is this about depression or in this can also be something your healthcare team can can help you with uh, and help you understand the signs of how depression might be in effect here and, and how it might be affecting your appetite and ways that you can address your depression and find that in so doing your appetite might return. So that would be another suggestion. That's great. Thank you. Thank both of you ladies so much for um, spending some time to answer a few of our participants' questions tonight. We really appreciate it um, and all the information that you th shared throughout the presentation. Um, so now I would like to share some additional resources with you all. Um, you will hopefully find these helpful and informative. Um, on the Can Do MS website, candu-ms.org, um, you will find archived webinars, e-news, library articles, and Can Do On Demand. Um, you can also submit a question to our Ask the Can Do team, which will be answered by our team of MS experts. I would also like to share some, some resources from the National MS Society. Um, they have a variety of brochures and video segments that can be accessed on their website nationalmssociety.org. So how can you help Can Do MS continue to provide educational programs at no cost? Join the Kick MS squad. Kick MS is our new peer-to-peer -peer fundraising platform and it's super easy to get started. Um, you can do anything to raise money for the programs, uh, just like the one that you attended today. Uh, you can ask for donations instead of gifts for your birthday. You can take part in a run or walk event. Uh, you can host a barbecue or even hold a bake sale. Um, these ideas are endless and the best part is you'll be helping other families such as yours have free access to our programs. Visit candu-ms.org backslash kickms to get started. 
Can Do MS is excited to introduce MS Path to Care, an educational initiative that aims to empower people affected by multiple sclerosis to be active partners in their healthcare experience. This collaborative initiative focuses on the importance of shared decision making in MS care and encouraging people with MS to work collaboratively with their support partners and their broader healthcare teams. We invite you to explore the resources when, within this initiative by visiting mspath2care.com. So our next presentation uh, will be our uh, webinar series on Tuesday, November 13th at the same time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. The topic will cover communicating about tough topics, caring for others while caring for yourself. As always, you can register for the webinar series free of charge on the Can Do MS website, candu-ms.org. For those participating live tonight, you will see a survey appear on your computer screen. Please take a moment to complete the survey and share your input. Your feedback helps us to continue to improve our webinar series. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight and have a wonderful evening.